friends. Happy Wednesday. It is Ask a Flower Farmer and it is your friend Lisa Mason Ziegler. Super happy to be here with you. And as you can see, I'm kind of in a, a different spot here, right? I'm um, actually in my office. I'm in my office here, which has been taken over by some of our bulk seeds. These are seeds that are already packaged waiting to go in to um, our pick racks that are around here. So I hope everybody is having a good Wednesday and a good start to your to January, right? So we're still kind of it's kind of perfect cool flower weather here in southeastern Virginia. We have um cool weather, you know, it's not going much below mid 20s. Days are kind of up in the 50s. We're getting rain every now and then. And this is all kind of cool season hardy annual weather. And the other thing that, you know, I really want to kind of highlight to everybody, and we'll get to seed starting here in just a minute, um, what I have to say about that, um, is this is the kind of weather that prevents us from being able to prepare beds for that second planting of the cool season hardy annuals, which is what I call very early spring. And that is six to eight weeks before your last spring frost, we plant cool season hardy annual transplants. Well, there is no preparing soil six to eight weeks. My first, my last spring frost is typically mid-April. So that means like mid-February, Valentine's Day to the 1st of March, is our planting window. And the soil will never be dry again. I mean, this has been going on all winter, but I just want to say to folks, you have to prepare those planting areas last fall for that very early spring planting because you really do not want to work cool, wet soil. Well, wet, it doesn't really matter about cool, right? But I mean, and when I say wet, I'm not, I mean, if you clump it and drop it and it doesn't all fall apart, um, I'd be hard pressed to know many people that truly have dry soil this time of the year because all it takes is one good deep rain during the winter and your soil never really dries out because of the cool conditions, right? So it is incredibly damaging to work wet soil. And I just want to say, if you need to build beds um, where, hold on, I'm going to have to shut the door. Um, so if you need to build some raised beds, maybe that may be your time to do it if you need to create some beds without disturbing your soil because it's really, really damaging. And so the other thing that we are just getting covered up on around here are seed starting questions. And Rhonda, who is our warehouse manager here, who so many of y'all have spoken to, and um, that's where a lot of your questions get pushed to that come in through email, um, is to Rhonda. And um, she and I were talking about it, and it is what she, she had a phone call the other day, I think, that kind of said it's just there's so many different ways of doing things and so many deep dives and it's so easy to go down rabbit holes and I was just looking for the piece of paper that Rhonda handed me the other day darn it I thought I had it here um anyway she said Lisa you need to just kind of like talk about the way that you've done everything and um and so the, the words at the top of her paper was keep it simple um, it is so easy, y'all, to go, to get all caught up in nitty gritty details. There are so many different areas of seed starting um, that you can get all caught up in one step and then be screwing up something else and not even realizing it. And so I just want to tell everybody that, I mean, that's probably the reason I have been able to kind of like just keep pushing forward is I don't tend to do a deep, deep dive on anything. I try to find sources that I that are experts that make recommendations or I learn the way that they do it. And I rely on them to deep dive. I say often I try not to memorize anything that I can look up. I mean, there's not but any space left up here anymore. And that's what I see a lot of people doing is getting all caught up in one. I mean, grow lights is a great example of that. I mean, I went to the professionals. 
Those were the ones that I used. They're the same ones that we sell. And I know there's other types out there. But guess what, friends? I don't need to know the difference in all of them. I know that the ones that we grow under do a great job. You know, they're available. They've worked really well, and I've tweaked my system to it. If you start deep diving on all the different types of lights, you may not come out for a year um, and be very confused on top of that. But you can do that on every single step. And so he, what I wanted to just mention, and I am going to answer your question. So if you have questions, put it down in the bubble at the bottom of the screen. Um, it's a bubble with a question mark in it, and I will do my best to get to as many questions. But something that we get a lot of questions about is, you know, how important is the blocking mix for soil blocking? So if you're new, you may not know that that's primarily the way that I do my seed starting is soil blocking. I do also do use plug trays. I use whatever method is the best for that particular seed for whatever it is that I'm doing. I mean, I use plug trays for sunflowers. Um, but 98% of all the seeds that I start are in soil blocks. And I know we have lots of soil blockers out there, and that is just so very, very awesome. Um, but one of the things that I see some people struggling with, first off, we, um, we get a lot of comments on here and on other lives that I do, as well as emails coming in, that their transplants aren't growing as quick, they're not as green looking, they just aren't thriving. Um, and I just, it made me, because oftentimes when we start talking to them, one of the things that we find a lot of people doing differently, which everybody obviously can do it their own way, I'm highlighting this because I think that this potentially is part of the root of some people's problems. Um, we are, and I also have to say, I did an interview with Jenny Love um, this week. So I'll be on the No-Till Flowers podcast with her. Jenny's a good friend. And she we talked about seed starting. And it made me revisit much of why I do things the way that I do. I knew it was going to be a deep dive talk. I mean, she wanted to talk about, you know, how it is so essential. The first few days of life for a seedling are so essential in how the rest of that plant's life goes. Um, and so I knew I needed to bone up on my why I do things the way that I do. And what really came up in our discussion, which I'm sure you'll probably hear um, if she doesn't edit it out, is that so many people um, don't use compost or an organic alive soil base, meaning they're using regular old mixes that are sterile. Um, and that kind of like just undermines the whole system. Um, and so I just wanted to say that the soil blocking recipe that I follow, I didn't make this up, y'all. Elliot Coleman did all the research. I didn't have to do it. It's not my recipe. It's his recipe. Um, is that it is so much more. So many people treat like, oh, well, the blocks hold together. Well, that's like one BB in the Astrodome of what that actual um, soil does. And I wanted to read you a paragraph from Elliot um, about seed starting. It's is kind of um, just talking about nutrients. Um, it is to optimize the growth of crops, a grower must first optimize the working of the biological factory in the soil. And I mean, I just couldn't say that any better. It's the biology that's in the soil that is taking care of your plant. And we don't want sterile anything. Um, our blocking mix recipe that we follow of his is based on compost or um, worm castings, or that's part of the recipe. There's, there's micro nutrients and there's microbes that are in there, alive stuff, and that's what really gets your plants off to the right start. So I'm here to say that next week, um, it'll get posted here on Instagram. I'm going to be doing um, like the seven moments of seed starting. Um, it's going to be a little short, step by step over seven evenings. Um, it's only going to be, it's not going to be very long. It is keeping it simple, y'all. And I'm going to talk about why we use the blocking mix, why we don't use sterile, what the steps are 
the environment and making the blocks and just going through kind of not so much the actual steps of doing it, but kind of the why behind why we do the things that we do. Um, because so often I hear people talking about, well, we just use ProMix or any whatever brand name of um, soil. And that's fine, right? I mean, it's whatever. But I'm saying that our experience and my understanding has definitely been because we don't use sterile we use stuff that has life in it. Um, it makes a really, really big difference in the way that your seeds start and the way that they get their start and get going. And it does affect the rest of their life. Um, that was really, it was a very interesting conversation I had with Jenny Love the other day. It just reminded me, I mean, I just started out that way because that's the way Elliot Coleman said to do it. And I've done it that way for all these years. And I know that people don't want to have to go through the steps of um, making their own soil at home, but it is so simple, y'all. And I'm going to be talking about that Saturday on Seed Starting Saturday on YouTube, 11 a.m. Eastern Time um, on YouTube or Facebook. And of course, it'll be recorded there so you can watch it later. Um, but, you know, we're so serious about this. We just added a second size to our nutrient pack that you mix with your compost and peat moss at home if you, um, or cocoa fiber, if you can't find the green sand and rock phosphate powders. And yes, they are significant. Um, they play a very huge role in the part of the health of our seedlings. Um, so I just, we're just getting a lots of questions about that as I know that we are all starting seeds. You know, I mean, we're, we've revved it up and our system is going. I got seedlings everywhere at home on the farm. Um, so catch up with me Saturday on Seed Starting Saturday. Um, and if you need nutrient mix, it now comes also, it, it's been coming in a two pound bag, which makes eight recipes. The five pound bag actually makes 20 recipes. A recipe is about 20 cups. You add your compost and peat moss to it. It makes about 20 cups. 20 cups makes about 600 of those small little three quarter inch blocks. So it goes a really long way. Um, but we got just got the five pounders in earlier this week. Um, so, and I'm gonna take you through the steps and share my tips on why it's just easier just and now's the perfect time to get an, all your soil components pieced together to have for your season and it is a piece of cake y'all and i think you'll be overly pleased with the results all right let's take a look at some of these questions all right in planting my garden i have a bed that has myself cedars in it poppies larkspur bachelor oh, bachelor buttons and so forth. My question is, can I just leave that bed year after year or do I need to rotate another crop into it? So the, the gift of reseeding um, plants, and there are several cool season hardy annuals, cool flowers, um, that do reseed themselves, many of which you just actually mentioned. So I call that, I think in cool flowers, I actually call that area the self-appointed garden. Um, it is really high maintenance to maintain a bed like that because, because you want the, the reseeding to perpetuate itself from year to year, you can't really mulch it very deep. And if you don't mulch, guess what does grow like crazy, right? Is the weeds. And so I literally used to keep, this was way before I went into high production. This is a long time ago when I first started. I had one bed that was only about 36 inches wide probably about 15 to 20 feet long that kind of was many of what you were just mentioning, Bells of Ireland, Poppies, Rudbeckias, um, and a few others that had been planted in that area that did reseed themselves. Well, I found myself down on my hands and knees having to weed out the, you know, because the chickweed will take that bed over in no time. That's a really cool season weed that's very common. Um, so you don't need to rotate, but you're going to have to get in there and really do some weed prevention removal um, when they're small to keep it up. I mean, the first year isn't bad. The second year, eh, eh, third year, usually you just have, it falls, it just gets all weed taken. So as far as rotation goes, because they're reseeding and um, there's a mix of them, I think you're fine. 
flower stables. Do you take down covers during the day if temperatures will be over 58 during the day? What about during rain? Um, so that's a great question. So she's asking, when, when do I take down my covers when it gets up to like 58? Well, it has to really kind of be sunshine. Taking the covers up and down is a lot of darn work, as I'm sure many of you know by now. Um, and so for me to take my covers down, I have to really feel like they're threatened with overheating. Um, plus, I do not want them to get so warm and cozy in there that they get a growth, growth spurt going. So if it's several, I look at the weather, two weeks on my app, right? I'm always looking at the two week window. And if it's gonna be 58 today um, and not really sunny, but it's going back cold tomorrow, no, I don't take my covers down. But if we're gonna have a run of warm afternoons and it's gonna be bright and sunny, I would probably take them down. I do not take them down for rain. Let's see. When starting Buplurum seeds inside in spring, should I cover or put on the mat? Then will they sprout? Where do you put them? Do they need to be kept cool? Yeah, Buplurum definitely needs cool to cold to actually sprout. We sow them on the surface of a tray. We use plug trays, moisten the soil, sprinkle two to three seeds on each cell, um, and then turn another cell upside down on top of the Buplurum tray to create the darkness that it needs. And we set it in the coolest place that we've got inside the building and ignore it for 10 days. And it usually um, sprouts really well. I have um, dill at home sprouting like that, that Bobo planted that's starting um, to come up. There's Mark. Can desiccant bags be reused? If so, how many times? Oh, you're welcome, Mark. So Mark is asking the desiccant packets, which is what we store our seeds with. That's the little packet you get like in your Tylenol or in tennis shoes that helps to absorb the moisture. You can reuse them, Mark. And actually, we actually Googled that to get the process. I mean, I think you can put them in your oven. They need to be dried out is what happens. And I kind of forget we no longer reuse them because there's so many of them, um, but you can. So I would search engine that and you are quite welcome. Um, so storing seeds properly, um, you can keep seeds so much longer. And we, you know, we have those special pepper seeds that are going to be coming online soon that have been high, you know, are for cut flowers. Um, if you want to get on the wait list for that, you need to get our app, go in there, search peppers, and get on the wait list. It's not on our website. It's inside our phone app. Um, the the, one, the one of our growers that's growing seed for us said, oh my gosh, did you know peppers can last 25 years when stored properly? So you want to store your seeds properly. We have a great article on our um, website and a blog that Rhonda wrote called Store Seeds Longer. It is the down on dirty on what you need to do to store seeds and desiccants are a part of that. Do you start at all, out all of your seeds on heat mat? Milk House asks. Um, everything does, with the exception of Buplurum and dill, starting in plug trays, as I just described, they don't go on heat. But everything else does go on the heat. They don't all stay as long as they typically do. Um, we found that Ami Magus and Dalkus. I'm just thinking, I think those are the only two. We put them onto the ceiling heat mat for about 24 to 36 hours. It kind of wakes them up. And then we set them on a bottom tray, on a bottom shelf of our grow stands where there's no lights on them. They just kind of sit there in cool conditions um, and they sprout like crazy. Um, but in general, everything goes onto the heat mat. Cool season stuff is on a cookie cooling rack to kind of warm it down. I mean, cool it down just a little bit. Um, but everything else, everything does go through the, the heat mat um, with the exception of a couple of things that really, really need it cool. Um, oh, let's see, can y'all hear Tucker chewing his bone? He's at my feet. In general, for cool seeds, what temperature should the room be? So Jenny and I were talking about this, and y'all, this is one of those rabbit holes. I mean, there is so much information about temperature control. My room, our target, when we have cool season hardy annuals on a seedling heat mat, which is in the same room 
as the racks with my grow light is about 60, 65 to 68 degrees. That's, that's the target. It isn't always that way, but that's what we really like for it to be. Warm season, we bump it up to 75 or 80 in there. And we do that, we could do that by controlling whether the door is open or closed that's adjoining to a conditioned part of our building. Um, so cooler for cool flowers and warmer for warm flowers. Creek Haven Flower Farm, all of my cooler flowers have germinated except my Ami, Daucus, and Phlox. Seeing as those are not on, are the only ones germinated yet, so do you think it's a common denominator? It's definitely probably temperature, although I don't grow phlox. I've never grown phlox, so I have no idea. But the Ami and Daucus, I would just set them off in a coolish, cool type temperature and just leave the tray sitting there. What get what would your guess be on the conditions in that room? They don't like it. It's been eight days. I bet you if you set that tray just somewhere like down at the bottom or on a concrete floor, um, Keep your eye. You don't want them to get bone dry, but you want them to not be super wet, and I bet you they'll sprout. It's all about temperatures, y'all. I mean, it's moisture, light, and temperatures. You just have to figure those three things out. And yes, there's 50 different kinds of light. You just have to get a light that does get, that gives enough light and figure out what your setup needs to be for that. Temperature is a really, really big one. And I know it's difficult for people to control temperatures um, sometimes. That's one thing I love about soil blocking. Because it takes up such a small space, you can start so much in a very small space if you want to. You can kind of create some conditions. I mean, literally, you can. I did it in my pantry when I first started. Then I did it on my kitchen counter, which wasn't the best place, um, and did it in my cool cellar. You can, because it doesn't need a huge setup, you can kind of manipulate your temperatures by where, I mean, if you've got a spare bedroom that you've got the vent closed in that room, there you go. That's a perfect place for cool flowers. All right. Hi there. Thanks so much for hosting this. My question is about snapdragon rust. Well, what a great question. So snapdragons um, get a disease called rust. I don't know what the, the botanical or the, the Latin name for that is. And I will tell you that I have only had rust once. And that was when I spring planted. We were doing testing of how, when, what, what, what's the best timing to plant snapdragons in the fall, very early spring, and then later, because, you know, you can get snapdragons to bloom later in the season by the number of the group it is. It's all about the day length, right? Well, what I, so I was doing that, and what became really obvious to me, I have never gotten rust on a crop that was fall planted. I've never gotten rust on a very early spring planted planting. But when I started stretching out those snapdragon planting dates here in my southern conditions, um, we were getting rust on our snapdragons almost before they bloomed. And plants fall victim to diseases and pests when they're not in their optimal conditions. And it was obviously more humid and more hot here um, than what snapdragons like, even though there are some that will perform under those conditions my conditions just, I mean, we got rust like nobody's tomorrow. I've never gotten rust again, by the way, because I don't do that anymore. We fall plant and very early spring plant. I don't try to get snapdragons later in the season because we have other things that we grow. Um, so having a healthy, strong, thriving plant definitely can help ward that off. Um, you definitely want to rotate and not plant back in the same place, um, but that's about the best I can do for you. I really don't have any experience with it, except that we've only gotten it under those circumstances. So this one is a good one. I just looked at these seeds. There something was in my way. I couldn't see your question. Could you please explain briefly on how to start Godisha from seed? So Godisha is a great germinator. We just actually, we have two trays at home of it that's pretty strong. I don't have a seed packet right here um, to actually, I don't even have a cool flower book in here, to actually look. I do not know whether they need to be covered or not with soil, which means do they need light or darkness? Um, cool flowers, Definitely will tell you whether it should need light or darkness. Um, again, it's all about cool temperatures. Um, we had right strong germination on it because we're growing um, 
the mix and I think the actual um, salmon color. Um, and I was just looking at those trays this morning is the only reason I'm remembering this. They uh, had really strong germination. So that means they can't be tricky. Y'all, that's the other thing. You know, if you're a new seed starter or you're feeling like you're kind of a novice, you know, maybe you've got a season under your belt, let the hard stuff go. <laughs> there are so many easy to start seeds and in my experience go I mean pretty much any seed that I'm telling you to start um, is usually pretty ABC to start you know and you just have to have those conditions right so um, that's all I can tell you about Godisha without having some a seed packet or book to look at here do you have any recommendations or resources for keeping deer out of the garden so the only, you know, we, even though I live in the middle of the city, we have pretty serious deer pressure here. We have a pack of, I think there's like 13 or 14 of them now um, that live in our neighborhood. And you can discourage deer, but the only foolproof way to prevent deer from getting in your garden is a true deer fence. And a deer fence is something that you have to hire somebody that does deer fencing or you have to do deep research so you do it right. That's a seven and a half foot tall fence. Um, that's secure so they can't get in by mistake and then not be able to get out. Um, that's the only foolproof thing I did because I can't have a, a fence that tall in the city. We sprayed um, and we would spray those crops that we knew that they were drawn to with once a month. Um, I would use three different sprays, Auburn, not Auburn, um, Cornell University did a study years ago and said that, you know, different deer sprays have different ingredients. And by mixing that up, I bought, I used three different types of deer spray. They were all the ones that lasted at least 30 days, which makes them a little bit pricier because the sticker that's in the product that holds the stuff to the late leaf is called the sticker. It makes it stick to the foliage. The, the more, the better the sticker, the more the stuff cost. Um, so if your package says spray every 30 days, you better put a more, you better put it on your calendar like it's a mortgage payment. Um, because on the 32nd day, that inert ingredient breaks down the sticker that holds the stuff that keeps them away to the leaf. So you have to read your directions and you have to follow them. And I use tree guard, I must garden.com. That is I must garden.com. They have a lot of varmint sprays and we have found them to be very effective. Um, tree guard, liquid fence, and I must garden. And we would use one this month, one the next month. You see what I mean? And you're changing it up and it really works. So you have to find a simple, easy way to spray so that you'll do it and you'll do it on time. And it definitely keeps them away. It did in our um, situation. All right, so I'm, this is my last question. It's almost time for us to get off here. When you do soil blocking, what do you do with a seed that says to plant a quarter of an inch deep? How do you cover them in a soil block? So, um, don't know what seed that is. It's probably one of the bigger seeds. Um, and so, if it is a larger seed, which I would imagine, then that would be in the two inch blocker. And the way that you cover any seed in a soil block, if it says it needs darkness, which is what this would need if it's going under a quarter inch of soil, is you just push it deeper in the block. We use toothpicks. You know, we'll turn the seed upright and then just push it straight down. That's what we do with tomatoes. You know, we start tomatoes and peppers. Um, all of them in the small blocker, the three-quarter inch, and they're one of the few things that we actually do bump up to the two-inch. Pretty much all the ones that I start in the small cluster blocker, a cluster of 20, the three-quarter inch, um, is what we start. I mean, we start marigolds and zinnias um, and azuratum and basil and all of that stuff. We time it so that they're at the perfect size and a beautiful transplant in that healthy soil at the right time to go out to the garden, um, to not, don't start way early. That's the whole problem with that. Um, so when you start plays a big key of that, but to drive, to, to create darkness for a seed that needs that, you just push it deeper into the soil. All right, friends. Um, all right, so I'm gonna answer this one last watering question um, and we'll see. Um, where we are here. When you water, do you wait until the top of the block is dry or the whole block is dry? So we water, I mean, 
again, talking to Jenny the other day was just such a great revamper. Oxygen is as port as important to the roots of your seedling as water and nutrients are. And the only way that they really get great oxygen is when they're in that drying stage. I mean, that's when the, the moisture um, is gone. That's when there's just really great air movement there. So we love the policy of having, we water every single morning. And when I go out to water in the morning, my blocks are dry. They are not blown, they are not bone dry, but they are definitely dry. And they're pretty much dry all the way through, I would say. Um, and the way that, that our environment is, the air temperature is as such that the plants, for plants to vegetative grow, they need to have warmth, right? So this is, can be a problem for people that are trying to grow plants while you're trying to start seeds on a heat mat behind you if it's cool flowers. Because you're trying to cool, when cool flowers are sprouting, they like warm soil, cool temperatures, air temperature. Well, that's not what grows great vegetative plants. They need a little bit more heat. And if your blocks are not drying out properly, I can almost promise you the air temperature is too cool. And if they're not drying out, they're not growing, they're not drinking, and they're not getting enough oxygen. Um, so really tweaking, I mean, in a perfect world, the germination um, heat mat would be somewhere away from where your grow lights are because the grow light setup can really stand to be a little bit warmer, much warmer for warm season stuff. But for cool season, you definitely want it to be hovering at 70. Um, so those plants will grow and as they grow, they suck the water out of the blocks too. Um, and you know, our grow room gets really hot in the summertime, just like a greenhouse does. And I still find that I only have to water once a day. I go into my grow room first thing in the morning, like seven or eight o'clock, water, and then those plants don't see me again till the next morning, literally. So I know that only once a day is possible to do, even in a hot conditions. Most people don't water thoroughly enough. They're afraid they're overwatering. I like to water until a little bit of water residue is left in the tray, and then I'll pour off any excess after it's sat for five to ten, maybe five minutes or so. Um, so I hope that helps you to understand be with the bees and folks. So remember, join with me on Saturday morning or over on YouTube on my channel that you can get to my channel through, um, my profile here in Instagram. And I'll be showing how easy it is to make your own soil. Not only is that super economical, it is healthy, vibrant soil. Um, that just really grows great, healthy, stocky transplants because your soil is as important as the light. I mean, we have so many folks that are really getting into the lights when they're not even thinking about what their the roots are, su are sunk into. And that's like such a major part. And it was just so good to talk to Jenny to revisit. I mean, and she talks about that there's research out there that says how well these guys get started and those first few days of life definitely affects the rest of that plant's life. And I've always said that we know that planting puny plants do not produce well. They're more disease and pest magnets. You know, plant they seek out insects definitely zone in on the vibes that plants give off when they're struggling and it just calls that stuff in and um, so, you know, is this the secret to how I've grown for all these years? Transplants so quickly that are so vibrant and healthy that hit the ground running. We've been able to restore the natural order on our farm and just, we just really don't suffer from a lot of pests and disease problems. Um, could it be from the start of our seedlings? I mean, after talking to Jenny, I'm feeling like it is an important piece that is a part of our program that I kind of had forgotten about and that is missing from so many people's program. The soil is just not something to stick the seed in and to have the vehicle to get it out to the garden. It is so much more than that. Um, so I will see you guys Saturday morning and you can check out at thegardenersworkshop.com. We have two pounds and five pounds of the nutrient mix if you need it to make your own. It's just green sand and rock phosphate or maybe you can find it locally where you are. All right, friends, until we meet again, going back to work. Ciao.